So, sleep is a very large subject. It takes quite a while to cover, so there's going to be quite a bit of information presented, and I'll try and convey it as best as I can. So, sleep in the station it essentially started from polygraph. What it is is just making physiological measurements using various sensors over your body. Um, so, initially, John August Larson created the first polygraph test. Uh, it's essentially, it was used as a lie detector initially, but the technology has been applied into sleep physiology. So, initially, the first few channels were just respiratory rate. Um, Electrodermal activity, so measuring salt changes and blood pressure and heart rate changes. But there's various types of sleep analysis, so basic sleep diaries are quite useful. Uh, basic pulse oximetry, so that's just using oxygen saturation probe and analysing the data there. Later on in the talk, I do have some data showing some basic pulse oximetry. There's limited sleep studies, which then you just increase the channels. So you can have some effort, possibly some naval flow. Uh, and then you have respiratory polygraphy, which has abdominal arthritic, body position, snore, nasal flow, respiratory inductance, oxygen saturations, pulse, and uh, left wave from the pulse. And then you have polyxomograph, which you put multiple, multiple channels on, so you can measure full EEG, full ECG, uh, muscle movement, because a lot of people have periodic leg movements, so you can put sensors on the legs. So it becomes quite intense for the patient to wear these sort of things. So I'll start off with the basic pulse oximetry. So this is just a trace from just a pulse oximeter. This isn't essentially a normal study, but the only channels you're seeing there is SPO2 and pulse. Uh, but pulse waveform is always recorded on the saturations, but not always displayed. It depends on the software you're using. So limited sleep studies, you start increasing the channels. So I've already mentioned the sort of channels you will see. And then spiritual polygraphy, again the channels just keep increasing and increasing and increasing. And then when we get to polysomnograph, we have up to 24 EEG leads. We have up to 12 uh, ECG and we have two PLM leads. Uh, you can also record video and sound. Uh, a lot of people have some parasomnias but they have unusual behaviours when they sleep. So it's often interesting to record these. So could you be a little bit slower? Slow? Yeah, sure. You are very, very fast. I'm just trying to be aware of time. <laughs> very good. OK. So there's a, a diagram of one of the devices. There's various flow sensors, the rack sensors, and you can even have transcutaneous carbon dioxide sensors and end tidal capnography. So you can get as much respiratory analysis as you can from polysomnography, as, long, as well as neuron. So, a little diagram of what it would be like for the individual to wear. So you can see you can do children and adults. So, children are looking very happy with all those sensors on, but whether the child is another story. Uh, but we've got looking somebody very comfortably sleeping soundly there, which might take a couple of days for them to get used to sleeping like that. So, sleep disorder breathing history. So, initially it was described as Pickwickian syndrome. So, this was quite a while ago. So, you know, humanity has been quite aware of sleep disorders, but not really initially how to analyse these sleep disorders. So, in 1970, the Stanford University, the first sleep lab was created. And in 1976, Colin Sullivan, who's in Australia, in Sydney, started to do more analysis in REM and non-REM sleep in dogs. So initially, the first sort of sleep studies were performed on dogs. Um, and then that was adapted to humans. Um, Sullivan also created the first continuous positive airways pressure device, which is the treatment for sleep apnea. So, obstructive slip apnea is described as cessation, cessation flow. So, there's no air going into the airways. You can often see effort, and the duration for an apnea is 10 seconds, as a minimum. I've seen up to three minutes of no flow entering the patient before. So, 
it can be quite disturbing for a partner to be observing this next to them in bed. So that's often what's usually described as the partner says you stop breathing and then they give them a nudge. But there's increased risk of cardiovascular disease, cerebral vascular disease, uh, diabetes, stroke. So there's a lot of comorbidities involved with sleep apnea. So this is a little flow diagram. I'm not going to concentrate too heavily on it. It would be made available to all of you, so you can study it in more detail. But essentially, it's just a flow diagram of actually how to investigate and the clinical outcomes based on the sleep investigation. So it's a very complex flow diagram, but I won't concentrate too much on it right now. So I'm going to start with some pulse oximetry. So this is a normal trace. This little box highlights the apnea index. So what we do is we look at how many desaturations for 10 seconds per hour of sleep, and that is 2.1. So anything less than five per hour is significant. Mild, so as we can see there, we have an index of 10. And you can see with the oxygen saturations, there's some dips, and this is when the apnea occurs. So some, you can have some quite sharp desaturations. It depends on the duration of the event. And as you can see, the pulse starts to become a little bit more spiky, so you get in the cardiovascular stress. Moderate sleep apnea. So I've highlighted an index of 18. So less than 5 normal, 5 to 15 mild, 15 to 30 is moderate. So as you can see, we get more extensive periods of desaturation and pulse rates going up to 120 there. Yeah. So, a lot of stress on the cardiovascular. Now we have somebody with more severe sleep apnea. So I've highlighted the index of 47 per hour. So that's quite a few events. And as you can see now, the saturation trace almost looks completely abnormal. There's hardly any normal, and you're getting very spiky pulse. So we have severe sleep apnea with hypoventilation. So as we get larger, we're going to underbreathe more, so oxygen saturations will drop more extensively. I've highlighted the box there, this is 75 events per hour. Their oxygen saturations are 85, so they're under oxygenating. And you can see it's very stressed in the cardiovascular system. I've highlighted another box. This is just showing how long the patient is spending below 90% saturations. And they're spending 93% of the time below 90. So one of the criteria for hyperventilation is that they've got to spend greater than 75% of the night below 90% saturation. But as you can see, the, the, the oxygen trace is getting lower, the desaturations are up and down. So, I've got a trace from pre and post non-invasive ventilation. So you can see initially, the patient's completely under oxygenating, they're having 32 events per hour, so they have severe sleep apnea along with hyperventilation. But once they get initiated on treatment, the test was repeated and almost normal, six per hour, so it's effective treatment. As you can see with the pulse, we've reduced the pulse, so there's far less cardiovascular stress in this patient. So, once we increase the channels, um, this is from somebody with chain stokes respiration, so this is somebody with heart failure. So you get waxing and waning pattern of the respiratory effort and then a long pause. Um, and what's happening there is, is the over and under breathe. So what happens is the carbon dioxide that they're breathing is triggering off the changes. And one of the carbon dioxide centre is on the main aorta. So obviously if there's not enough pressure against that baroreceptor, they start to breathe, so the, the carbon dioxide control level widens. Initially show the desaturation there. And you can see where there's effort visible, but there's still no flow. So it's a little bit of a mixture, so they can have some air obstruction as long as have well, a central sleep happening. So you can get mixed pictures. So it becomes very interesting once you start validating the data. So I've got an hour by hour trace from a pulse oximetry. Uh, and as you can see, it's very sawtooth, very jaggedy. And uh, over here is probably a red related hyperventilation moment. 
because their efforts decrease during the render. And as you can see, over here, that's the time index. You can see a sharp desaturation there, and then a sympathetic pulse spike. So you can see the auction drops, pulse goes up. So, a little bit more physiology. So this is showing a apnea trace. Um, and down in the bottom left is the physiological responses in the body that happens during these apnea. So as you can see, there's a, there's a lot of biomarkers that are, are triggered off. So you have TNF1-alpha, that's one of the rheumatoid markers for arthritis. Um, you've got the ILA, IL-6, so these are more inflammatory markers as well. Um, <clears throat> and what happens is you get endothelial dysfunction, there's adhesion, so you can get more risk of clots. Um, lymphocytes are activated, platelets become aggravable, so again more clotting. Um, reactive oxygen substances, so free radicals, they can trigger off cancers and things. And over here, on the right, is to do with ATP generation. So within the mitochondria, that is the power, isn't it, that gives us energy. And what happens is, when we can't use oxygen, we use other substances. So it's got xanthin dehydrogenase, and that then is reacted with hypoxanthine, and that makes xanthin oxidase, urate, H2O2, so obviously they have to urinate more in the night, so they're getting up to go to the toilets, that's causing even more sleep disturbance. And just all these free radicals. So you can see there's a lot of negative outcomes based on having severe sleep apnea. So, I'm talking a lot about obstruction, now we talk about central. So, commonly caused by CNS depression and neurological disorders and heart failure. So these are the most common causes of central. Um, there's other rare causes, but they're very few and far between. So I won't discuss any of those others in detail. So, this is just showing the pH and O2 changes during the chain stokes and apnea. Because uh, obviously it's a chemoreceptors, so the pH control is triggered off by the carbon dioxide changes. So as effort decreases, carbon dioxide goes up, triggers the brain to increase respiratory effort, carbon dioxide then is vastly reduced, pH change, they pause to try and retain a bit more CO2, and it's just continuous. And they can do this when they, if they really have severe heart failure, they can even change soap to while away. So just more features of chain stokes, so you can see with the CO2 changes. So you have hypercapnic periods, apneic periods. All good so far? So, now we're getting some more channels of sleep now. So this is a polysomnograph check, trace. So as you can see, there's many, 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 many channels to display and to observe. So it takes a trained eye and it takes time to validate this data. But as you can see, during the increased effort, you're getting arousal in the ED traces. So obviously it's taking them out of a deep sleep, put them into a lighter sleep, and then when they wake up, they're even more tired than when they went to bed. So, you know, they just end up feeling very tired all the time. So actually treating these sort of disorders, you can improve their daytime care. So I'm just highlighting where the chain stokes is going on, and where the arousal is. So we're going to move into sleep architecture. So everybody has structured sleep. So as you can see, this is from infant to adult. So you can see the difference of the wake, REM, and non-REM periods. And as you get older, we spend more time awake, less time asleep. So obviously you can see when you have 10 years, a 10-year-old needs roughly 10 hours sleep to have a good quality sleep. So often children, are, if they're not sleeping for very long, they end up tired, their mood changes, so they, they maybe become more misbehaving, things like that. So actually, getting your children to have a good night's sleep early on will benefit them when they're adults. And also, they will achieve better at school because they've been more wet. And as you, as you get to an adult, we roughly need about eight hours sleep. We spend more time in non rem so this is a very deep sleep. So you need to spend most of your time in a deep sleep to recuperate and feel refreshed in the morning. And we spend a small period in REM. 
Can I ask? Uh, sure. First chance again. Uh, I, I, I sleep for four hours. And I don't have a problem. Is that <laughs> Depends on the quality of your sleep. So some people can exist from four or five hours as a minimum. But if it's good quality, you will feel refreshed. So if it's poor quality, you won't you feel extra tired. So depends if you have sleep apnea or not. If you have sleep apnea, it's going to be poor quality, isn't it? But if you don't, it's going to be good quality. So it varies. So you can get a maximum of 10 and pretty much a minimum of 5. So 4 hours is just below the minimum. But if you can function, it's not a large issue. So um, the minimum is 4 to, four to 5 hours. Four to five hours that's maximum 10. Or 10. I don't think many people get 10 hours sleep, to be honest. <laughs> be lucky if you get 10 hours. <laughs> well, I roughly sleep for about 6 hours. So, no, I feel quite fresh after 6 hours. So, mm -hmm. Making sure you go to bed at a reasonable time. So, sleep onset. So, within the EEG, you can see changes in the different waves. So, when you get into a deeper sleep, you get into the more slow wave, K-complexes and things. Um, and when you're more awake, it's more erratic, uh, the, the brain's more active, the body's more active. So you can see the changes in the stages of sleep when you have a full EEG on. So you've got EEG, so electroencephalogram, EOG, electrooculogram. So when you're in REM, it's rapid eye movement. And what happens is your eyes go left to right, left to right, left to right. So if you put a little sensor up here, you can tell when the eyes are moving. And the EMG is the muscle movement, electromyogram. So you attach it to the legs to see if the legs are twitching or not. Could you just explain that? I'm not quite sure what that graph shows. So at the top, we've got some alpha activity. Then we've got beta, theta, and over here is the, the, the K-complex. So usually this is happening during dream stages. So you can have repeat K-complexes. We're presuming it's a dream, because that's the thing, is dream analysis is, is, is not a perfect science. Because we dream throughout all periods of sleep. People think we just dream during REM, but no, there's evidence that we, we dream throughout. And down here is just showing the slow wave. And this is in REM, so you can see REM is very similar to wakeful stages. So at the top is more wakeful, this is more deep sleep, and obviously this is in a lighter stage of sleep. I mean, I've spent hours and hours and hours talking about brain activity in sleep. So, you know, we'd need far much more lecture time. Yeah? Is, is dreaming part of normal sleep? Yes, dreaming is part of normal sleep. You should all dream. Whether we retain our dreams is a different story. It depends what stage of sleep you wake from. If you wake from a deep sleep stage, you know, you're going to have less memory of the dreams. But if you wake up in a lighter stage, it's far more vivid in your brain. So some people who have nightmares are in a light stage of sleep. So, you know, and, and the body should be restful and paralyzed. So some people start to move, act out, so sleepwalking, sleep talking. It's very common. So most people do sleep talk at some point. It depends what stage of sleep you're in. And it depends if it's disturbing others. That's what I mean. It's, it's, in terms of parasomnias, that's a whole other lecture. So I'm not going to go in depth into parasomnias and unusual sleep behaviour. I'm trying to concentrate on respiratory sleep behaviour. <laughs> I'm happy to come back and present more on different times on sleep. So, sleep architecture. So it's just how your pattern of sleep. So, I've got a little bit of funny diagram of architecture for the pyramids. Uh, you can see non-REM is a relatively inactive, yet regulated in brain in mobile from the body. A highly inactive brain in a parallel body. So uh, REM, this is, like I say, is a much lighter stage of sleep, but you should be fully paralyzed. So people who sleepwalk, they're not releasing the dopamine, so they start to move around. So, so often it's, it's a biochemical change that causes these behaviors. So characteristics of non-REM. So as you can see from the previous slides, where you have more deep, we've got stage one, very active. Stage two, you start to get the K-complexes. Stage three, it's almost wakeful, but you get more of some of the slow wave. 
And then stage four, very slow wave, deep up and down. This is your brain activity. Um, recently, though, they have merged stage two with stage three. Because they're very similar. And it's hard to define the differences. So we only really have stage one, two, and deep stage three now. But I've just listed all the different types. So you have K complexes and sleep spindles. So again, it's just voltage changes in the channel. So we're just measuring very small voltage changes. So um, very sensitive sensors on the body. And the sleep spindle again is involved with dream. So in some sleep labs, they will measure brain activity with MRI along with the EEG just to show which different parts of the brain are active and in it. So this is some of the characteristics of non-REM. So you've got the activity in the parietal lobe, the frontal lobe, in the temporal lobe and in the thalamus. So again, it's showing more of the different waves, active, alpha waves, theta, beta and delta. Now, characteristics of REM sleep. So you can see REM, far more different parts of the brain are active during these REM periods than in non REM. And it's very, very close to wakeful brain activity, very close. Because REM is so close to being awake, so it's, it's very easy to wake up during a REM period. And when you're in a non REM, some people wake up startled because they're in deep sleep. So if somebody nudges you, you go, Wake and shock. So other characteristics. So you can see that these are just the different activities in the channels. So awake, non-REM, and REM. So there, there are subtle differences. Um, it's showing the heart rate as you're in a deeper sleep, it's a lot lower. So you, your heart rate will drop roughly eight beats when you're in a deep stage. And mean blood pressure drops as well. Just to of course, I would expect uh, breathing to be regulated at the respiratory center. Yes, respiratory rate is reduced as well. At the respiratory center? In yes, in the brain. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, uh, so, so, and some of these uh, responses that from there or are some of these uh, because I don't see the, the, the. Yeah, so this is just showing that uh, your, your, your chest wall movement, heart rate and blood pressure because you can add blood pressure to, to there's nothing on the oh yes, yes so all the sensors are on the brain so you're having probably about 60 sensors on the body if you're doing a full polysomnogram that's why it's quite difficult to sleep properly. But usually people with sleep disorders are very tired anyway. So they, they, you, know, you can sit them in the corner and they'll drop off very quickly. So these are the sort of investigation. We wouldn't investigate somebody that wasn't sleepy. So that's, that's the reason the main cause. Why is this person constantly falling asleep, can't fall in the job, possibly having car accidents and things like that. So you know, there's a lot of other risks involved. But you, know, you need to function in the daytime, don't you? And you need to stay awake be able to concentrate. So when you have sleep disorders, once it's investigated, you can uh, you know, apply the appropriate treatments and then they will improve their life significantly. So sleep regulation, we roughly have a 24 hour body clock, roughly. Um, you can get early phase sleep pills. So these are the early risers. So they go to sleep early, get up early, and then you have more of the late phase sleepers. So they usually have a slightly greater than 24 hour clock. So they want to go to bed a little bit later and they want to get up a little bit later. And here again, it's the late. So most people should have a circadian rhythm, 24 hours, not under 24 hours and not greater than 24 hours. Although there's not almost 24 hours in a day. It's 23.8, this is why we get a leap here. That's why it gets a bit more difficult now. <laughs> Not that it was already difficult. So, sleep regulation. So you have the, the internal pacemaker. 
So the superchiasmic nucleus, C S C N. And then you get the circadian cycle, the Zietzberg. So we have the light dark phases. So as it gets dark, it should trigger your body to start to feel tired. So if you have a lot of artificial light in the night, it doesn't trigger off these Zietzberg changes. So in a moment, I'm going to talk about a bit of melatonin, which is one of the biochemicals that regulate sleep. But again, it's social, what they mean by social contact, if people are going out, interacting, going to the pub, this is not going to make you tired, this is going to make you more wakeful, unless you're having too much to drink. But then you, you know, don't sleep when you have too much to drink, you lose consciousness in the end. <laughs> so you wake up just as tired. So it's not advisable to drink to make yourself go to sleep. It's best to get a better sleep pattern than drinking. Yeah, and also food as well. After a meal at lunchtime, you feel a bit tired. So then that can soften trigger off. So having tea in the evening, you start to settle, things like that. So it's, it's having the right behaviours in the, in the evening to trigger off a good sleep. So, it's shown where the pineal gland, and this is where the melatonin is created. And as you can see, it starts off as the light enters the eye, it hits the, the correct part of the brain, which triggers off the release of melatonin, and then this increases tiredness. So, um, some people have difficulty going to sleep, and they stay awake for most of the night. So, you know, you can give melatonin injections, but from my experience in England, it's not as effective as people would hope. Um, but it can be used. So, this is just showing the changes. So, also your body core temperature drops roughly by about 2 degrees, and this triggers off the plasma melatonin release. So you can see it's just within a 24 hour clock there. So you can see in the daytime, plasma melatonin's low. In the nighttime, it's at its highest. And the body temperature as well is dropped. So cooling the body can help you feel tired as well. So if it's a really hot night, it's quite hard to fall asleep and get into a deep sleep. And this is because you're not releasing enough melatonin because the core body temperature is not dropped. Enough. So other physiological changes, so skeletal muscle tone changes, Temperature regulation, cardiovascular regulation, ventilation, endocrine function, renal function, gastrointestinal, and hepatic system. The liver function changes between night and day. So you see inside how essential for your full body function it is to get a good night's sleep. So, once you've measured all the EG, you can get these. Um, Hypnograms. So this is just showing the different stages of sleep. So you can see down here is the deep stage, and then we have a REM, another deep stage, another REM, another deep stage, another REM. And as you can see, the deep stages get shorter, the REM get longer. Um, this is somebody who's getting a very good night's sleep, because uh, I usually don't see much more than four periods of REM. Uh, and as people don't sleep for a very long time, Three periods, but as long as you get at least two periods of REM and two periods of deep sleep, you should feel refreshed. If you get in less than that, or if you can't get into a deep sleep, this is where you increase your daytime tiredness. So, a little diagram of the nervous system and what parts of the body is controlled and where it's triggered. So, you've got the autonomic nervous system. Showing this is wakefulness and non-REM, in sympathetic activities decrease, parasympathetic activities increase. And then during REM, sympathetic activity decreased, parasympathetic increased. So you can see it can have different sorts of triggering in the body during these periods of sleep. So you know your central nervous system is controlled and regulated during sleep as well. So let's talk a little bit about cardiovascular changes. So, myocardial contractility is decreased, so stroke volume is less. This is why blood pressure drops, heart rate drops, and your blood pressure drops roughly about 10%. It should do. You get some hypertensive people, which obviously, you know, their blood pressure will be a lot higher when they're asleep. So actually, treating their sleep disorder will actually reduce their hypertension during the day. So if you think about it, there's a lot of medications for hypertension, taking tablets, but by treating their sleep disorder, they may not need this daytime tablet, possibly. So, 
You can see during arousal and phasic REM sleep, so in the lighter stages, sympathetic activity increased, heart rate is increased, blood pressure comes up, vasoconstriction happens, so there's less blood flow, and myocardial contractility increases. So again, showing another trace of previous with different periods, and I've just summarised the, the changes that I've just discussed. So, physiological respiratory changes. So acid-base balance changes slightly. Uh, the PCO2, which is your acid buffer, and your oxygenation changes. So the receptors that control it are in the carotid body chemoreceptors. This is where I took from the main aortic arch. And then there's CNS receptors in the brain, lung mechanical receptors, so you can the stretch receptors, and the receptors in the hypothalamus, which are your thermal receptors. So we're covering a lot of physiology in, a, in this period. But as I said, I will make all this information available. Um, you'll have my email as well, so if you ever have any questions, I'll be happy to take emails and make a discussion. So again, you get metabolic changes, so your pH for your CO2, your behavioural changes, because personality can change. So if you get poor sleep, somebody becomes very angry, very grumpy. So you're treating them, they become a much happier person. Okay? So, you can have hypoxemic events, that's during the apnea, and then the hypercapnia increases, the ventilatory response changes, um, upper airway muscle tones relax, and this is why they snore. So when you go to sleep, your body's relaxed, you start to snore, the airway can collapse under the negative pressure changes as we breathe in. And again, the airway diameter is reduced a little bit. So some people wheeze at night as well when they go to sleep. So it's very relevant to the respiratory, not just the neuro. So I mean, the whole body works together, so it's good to have a broad understanding of the entire body, but it's a very big system, isn't it? So not one person can be a master of the body. It's too complex. So it's having a collaboration and working with other people in different specialisms and sharing knowledge. It's very useful. I mean, you know, the knowledge in this room is probably massively vast with all the brains that we have in this room. Put them all together and then you have a superhuman brain. But, and again, another uh, summary of the changes. So, wakefulness drive, the pedal of the pons and the cortex. The CO2 drive decreased, muscle tones decrease, upper airway resistance increases, and the response to CO2 and oxygen is decreased. So overall minute ventilation drops. So you're starting to hyperventilate under it. So often some of these saturations are 98 percent in the day, could be around 95, 94 when they're asleep. But obviously that's not unoxygenating, they're getting plenty of oxygen. And hopefully the CO2 shouldn't go up too high. So if you get high CO2 during the night, you tend to wake up with a throbbing headache because it causes a lot of vasodilation. So in the UK you tend to call it a carbon dioxide hangover. So if somebody like, feels like they've had lots to drink when they wake up and they've not drunk a drop, it's often they've got a lot of carbon dioxide in their body. And then what happens is they wake up and they start to breathe all the carbon dioxide away, the headache clears. So that's one of the symptoms we look at for hypoventilation, for ventilatory treatment, is, is, is a morning headache. So I'm coming close to the end now, because I know I've covered quite a lot, and I'm being very much aware of the time as well. I was given an hour. And this talk is usually two to three hours long, usually. So hopefully I haven't broken anybody's brains. Um, because I know often my brain can feel like it's bursting at times. But I'm glad and I hope everybody has enjoyed the talk. And everybody's falling asleep. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs>